Hello everyone, today is Thursday, December 15, 2016, and this is the week in charts. Obviously, I want to thank all you guys and girls for being here. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. So, what do we talk about? Well, I don't want to beat the dead horse too much on the Trump thing, but it seems to be uh, in the news quite a bit. I do catch a little news here and there. So, I'm going to continue talking about that. And I think the focus needs to shift more to... Is there a new bull leg underway? And we'll talk a lot about that when we get to the live charts. Obviously, your questions on trading. Uh, start thinking about what you might want to ask now. Um, if you don't mind, keep it uh, mostly to what's on the slides, but uh, we'll. Uh, but you could ask anything you want. And then on the stock picks, wait until we get to the actual charts and open it up for stock picks. And if you don't mind, just type in one question at a time. I'm sorry, one stock ticker at a time and hit return. That way I can go through them and know what I covered and what I did. And so you'll get all your stocks covered. Feel free to ask about 100 stocks if you want, but just ask about them one at a time. And I want to talk a little bit about the church of what's happening now as it relates to methodologies. And then I want to talk about the church of what's happening now as it relates to trading where the trend is. And that will make a lot more sense in a few minutes. There's a disclaimer screen. As you know, you can lose money trading. Or as I often sum it up, borrowing a line from my friend Greg Morris, all predictions about the future. And a lot of stuff can happen to me now and then. Now, again, I don't want to beat this uh, Trump dead horse too, too much. But the thing you just need to remember, as I've been saying for the past several weeks, is be really careful with big picture ideas. I remember um, coal stocks seemed to do okay when Obama first came in. Uh, in spite of Obama going to eliminate coal. And then, as I said, last few weeks, gun stocks went up like 900% under under Obama, and he was the most anti-gun president ever. So logically, these things can make a lot of sense, but markets are often illogical, as you know. So be careful with that. And be careful not to become attached to an idea, a big-picture idea like this, or become emotional about it. So that's the thing that I wanted to point out. And rarely, reality never unfolds as it has in the past. So I'll probably stop saying this since I said it last few weeks, but I know we have new people coming in all the time. Now, I want to talk a little bit about being all things in all markets as it relates to changing methodologies and being part of the church of what's happening now. Now, I remember many years ago, I would get stopped out of a short, and I talked to a friend of mine who was a trader, and he'd say, oh, no, I played that reversal, okay? Or I'd get stopped out of a long, and he's like, no, I'm playing that reversal. And then maybe the market would rally up a little bit, and I'd be short and continue to get stopped out. And he's like, no, 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 I'm playing that breakout. No, I'm playing that trend. Oh, I'm playing that reversal. And then all of a sudden, he's this big reversal trader. And then lo and behold, the market goes sideways. And then he's a breakout trader, and breakouts usually fail. But whenever he would get longer breakout, they wouldn't. And then all of a sudden, he just magically became a reversal trader when the market was reversing. A breakout trader was when it wasn't and was following through, and so on and so forth. And obviously, and I haven't been in touch with him in 20 years, but if I was still talking to him today, I'm sure he would be a reversal trader a week or so ago, a few weeks ago. I think this is a weekly chart. And, of course, he'd be a breakout trader and now a trend follower. So here's the thing. You can't be all things in all markets. And to that, I would call bullshit, okay? If you do try to be all things in all markets, you'll really end up chasing your own tail. So if you're, if you're trying to trade a choppy market system, then all of a sudden the market breaks out. If you try to be a breakout player, then all of a sudden breakouts are going to fail. Let me redo that. So you're trying to trade a choppy market system, and then you start trading it. So you short at the top of the range, and all of a sudden the market breaks out. So you're like, you know what, I'm going to start trading breakouts. So you go to trade a breakout, and what happens, the market comes right back in. So you try to trade reversals, and what happens, the trend keeps going down. 
So, well, maybe I'll be a trend follower now. What happens? Well, a reversal comes back. And you can't be all things in all markets. It's simply just not possible. Now, I believe in trading where the trend is. A friend of mine years ago, and by trading with the trend is, I mean just sticking with one thing and finding those trends and seeking out those trends. And I'll show you why in just a second. But a friend of mine many years ago, and this is, this is long before I took my efforts full time, he said, if Dave heard that intravenous drug use was on the rise, he'd buy needles. And I'm, I don't think I'm that bad, but I, I, I am kind of wondering, though, is intravenous drug use on the rise? John, hang on on those stock picks. Uh, I'll, we'll look at those when we get to the charts, but uh, don't ask for any more until we get to the charts because it's going to uh, it's going to hide everybody's questions. No, no big deal though. We'll get to the charts in a minute. So trading with the trends is if you might ask yourself if trading with the trend is is it that the church of what's happening now? And no, you're simply following along and you're remaining a trend follower and you're not trying to shift methodologies, okay? So it's trend following. And in trend following, what you are doing is you're recognizing current conditions, okay? Now, I underlined or uh, italicized following here because we're not trend predicting. If you're trading a reversion to the mean system, then you're trying to predict that that, that pop is going to reverse, okay? With trend following, you're recognizing a current trend, and then you're looking to get on board that trend. I guess it would be more like this. You recognize it and then look to get on board. In my case, it would be on a pullback. So are the conditions up, are the conditions down, or are the conditions sideways? And I should have italicized current here. Are the current conditions up, down, or sideways? Now, trend following means you're going to stay with old positions. You're not going to say... A lot of times we'll get long a stock and then I'll have a big reversal and stop us out. And eventually all trades end badly. And I'm, I'm probably beat the dead horse on that a few times today. And everybody's like, hey, Dave, why didn't we get out here? It's like, well, because we didn't know if this was just going to be one of many corrections and it would stop short of our stop and keep on going. As I often preach, if you quit when you're up 25%, you'll never make 50%. If you quit at 50%, you'll never make 100%. And if you quit at 100%, you'll never make 1,000%, okay? But Dave, how often do you make 1,000%? Not very often, but this is where the real money is, and this is how you win longer term in trading. So you want to stay with your old positions until proven wrong. And guess what? You're going to overstay your welcome. I'm working on a beginner's course, and I'm amazed at how many times I've, I've reused the same slide throughout the course when it comes to psychology, when it comes to money management, and when it comes to the methodology in general. The same slide being that all trades eventually end badly. So if you're trading my methodology, several things will happen. One, two and three. One, you're going to get in and you're going to get a little swing trade out. Then you're going to get stopped out for what I call better than a poke in the eye trade. You're going to make 1% on your account, and I'll show you the portfolio in a minute. And then you're going to make 0% on the remainder of the trade, but overall you make 1%. And that's what I call the better than a poke in the eye trade. You're not going to get rich doing this. In fact, longer term, if this, all, if this is all you did, you would actually lose money eventually because sooner or later you're going to get hit really hard with a so-called black swan type of event. Now, the other thing that can actually happen is you can actually lose on a trade because no one knows exactly what a market will do. Not you, not me, and as I often say, certainly not the guy who screams on TV, okay? So on every trade, there is a chance you will get stopped out. So this trade ends badly because what happens? Well, you make money, but you eventually get stopped out. 
And then in this particular case, this is what we're looking for, right? We're looking to capture that swing trade, which is a good thing, obviously, and trail that stop up and ride out this trend as long as possible. But in the end, the trend ends badly. Now, in this particular case, and in this particular case, these were both positive events. You made money, okay? And the example I'm using in the intro course is it was up about 200%, and then you only made about 150-something percent of the trade. Well, that's better than poke in the eye, okay? Much better than poke in the eye. This is better than poke in the eye, okay? And as I often say, when people get pissed off because they gave up some open profits, I tell them to just send me that whole, send me all the money, and to keep some money out, take a, get a massage, you know? And center yourself and just forget about that trade like it never happened. And in 20-something years, and I know I'm beating a dead horse here, but in 20-something years, I have never received a check from anyone. So you're just going to have to get over it. In the end, it will end badly. So you will overstay your welcome on those positions. And you always will feel a little bit of regret, but you can't, you can't look at how much money you lost, I should say, or how much money you gave up from up here. Let's say you get in here. You have to just look at it from from here to here, and you have to look at it as how much money you made, and you need to feel good about that, okay? That's what trade follow is all about. And this is another speech in and of itself, but you cannot mentally monetize your trades when they're way up here, okay? If you must mentally monetize, you'd say, okay, well, if I get stopped out, borrowing overnight gaps, I'll make this much money in a trade. But be careful as a general statement and mentally monetize it because if you're up here, you're thinking, wow, I could pay off that credit card. I could pay off my car. I could buy something with this. And then the market implodes. It's like, well, shit, now I can no longer do that. So you put yourself into a state of regret. Now, we talked quite a bit about state of regret in prior uh, presentations, so I'm not going to beat the dead horse too much on that. Now, it also means that you're going to change sides on new positions. Now, this is something I have to cover quite often. And, and again, as my wife says, you say a lot of the same shit every day, and I'm going to keep saying it until people get it. And that's because, let's say, the overall market does a bona fide bow tie down, and we're long some stocks. Well, people like, this happens all the time. Or even if you're long a stock, longer term trend following and it begins to roll over let's say it bow ties down and this was another lecture we gave i gave not that long ago and in fact i'll show you the example here in just one second the question is why not exit even though the stop isn't hit because it looks pretty obvious it's going to hit the stop well as a trend follower we don't know if this is just going to be a big correction that's going to take off again or we're going to get stopped out on a bottom find reversal so we just don't know so what you do is you just follow along. So that means that sometimes the overall market might be rolling over like it did recently. And we're long a bunch of stocks, okay? And we begin to get a little nervous. I was a little nervous right before the election, okay? I'll be honest. I, don't you hate people who are like, I'm going to be honest with you. You've been lying to me this whole time. But <laughs> quite frankly, I was a little nervous because we were very long coming into this election. And we had some signals of the overall market that didn't look good. So it doesn't mean that you want to bail out. But you might begin to change sides on new positions. You might begin to say, well, maybe it's time to start shorting when the market begins to roll over a little bit. And by the way, you're going to be a little late to the game. And that's why it's called trend following and not trend predicting. Now, the other thing that could happen is sitting on your hands when the market begins to chop sideways. Now, what could happen is, let's say the market's trending nicely and you're long a bunch of stocks and all of a sudden it starts chopping around. Well, keep in mind that you might get whipsawed out of your existing positions. And as I often say, and let me just draw this on a big uh, blank screen. As I often say, if you're looking at the drawdowns, when the trend turns or when the market becomes choppy. The drawdown, this is the market. And these are your this is your equity curve. So your equity curve is going to look like this. And then all of a sudden it's going to begin to take a bit of a nosedive. But the good thing is the longer the market goes sideways, the more 
the equity curve is going to begin to flatten out, okay? And if you're super duper selective, right here you're sitting on your hands and you're not doing anything, okay? And if you're super duper selective, maybe every now and then you'll, you'll find a little winning stock and then go back to sitting on your hands. And then you might slowly climb out of that drawdown. But the good news is the point I'm trying to make here is that the drawdown is going to be mitigated because eventually when this market begins to go sideways, you're going to get stopped out of your positions. But don't think, okay, I need to exit all my positions now. And then once it chops around, why would you continue to hold on positions? Because you don't know if this is just a big consolidation and this market is going to take off again. This goes for the overall market and this goes for individual positions. This is the so-called dead money report that I do week after week after week or whenever we have a dead money situation, okay? Have you made any progress on a course trading Phoenix stocks? Those are often the most excitement. Um, the Phoenix stocks, I don't know if that could be a whole course, but it might be. Uh, and what Gary's asking about as far as transitions are concerned is, I don't want to digress too far, but he's just saying that sometimes you get these stocks that make these big, huge bottoms, and then they begin to take off again. Uh, metals and mining might do this, make multi-year all-time lows, and then you get a bow tie or something like that. So the bottom line is, I'm not sure if I can make a complete course out of this other than just look for stocks to bottom out for a long, long time, make sure there's no overhead supply nearby or even further back that could damper, um, put a damper on your trade and then look to go long. But yeah, I don't want to digress too far into that, Gary, but thanks for your interest. I appreciate that. I'll, it's in the back of my head. There's so many things that I'm working on now. It's the beginner's course has taken me about a year and a half so far. So much for um, cranking that out. Now, here's the tough part, and it always comes back to whatever you talk about a methodology, it always comes back to psychology and then quite often money management too. And that's why I'm always preaching about how the three things are intertwined and cannot be separated. But you have to always remember, as a trend follower, you're not going to look smart quite often. And in fact, they might even call you a trend-following moron. To those of you, I know most everyone here is a friend to the show and been around a while uh, as far as to, uh, indoctrinated in my stuff. But years ago, I got this label because there was someone, and I'm not exactly sure who he is because he was doing it through an anonymous email, but when I called him out on it, the emails immediately stopped. So I'm pretty sure I know who it is. And it's someone, someone famous, and it's someone who should know better. And he was actually a fan of my work. He was fascinated with all this Internet thing that was happening, this boom, and all this, uh, these Internet sites. And there was only a few back then. It was just Trading Markets, Market Watch, and Streetcom. I think that was it. You know, and we were, we were the only three out there. And he was fascinated with it, and I kept drawing these big blue arrows on the chart. He was fascinated how I was just riding out these dot-com stocks, and he just thought it was great. But this person started shorting like crazy because he confused the issue with facts. And I think it might have been a commodity I was talking about at the time that was going up, and I was drawing my arrows, and he couldn't believe it was going up, and he was heavily short. And I don't know if he got wiped out or not. I never heard from him again once I called him out on it. But... Anyway, he told me I was a trend following moron and basically some other really nasty things too. And initially I was very hurt because I had the utmost respect for this individual. But then you know what? It stuck. And that has really helped me to give up my ego and not try to, to predict so much and be so smart and to get out exactly at the high and to try to do all these other things to beat the market. Instead, just follow along. And it's kind of interesting. When I became a member of the American Association of Professional Tactical Analysts, initially uh, I, I thought, wow, I'm going to go to these meetings and learn a bunch of, uh, bunch of uh, complex things and, 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 and all this gee whiz stuff. And to my surprise, I ended up just getting – 
uh, some more, much more simpler things, just have them reaffirmed. Like, I think my speech here on, on trend following and using the word following and emphasis, emphasizing that word following so much is probably because of speeches that were given by Greg Morris, where he just talked about how following is a key word in that sentence and things like that. So it just kind of reaffirmed what I was already doing. And yes, I learned quite a few things here and there. But for the most part, it just mostly reaffirmed to keep things simple and to just follow along. And, and by the way, as a trend follower, the only way to profit from a market is to sell higher than you buy or to buy lower than you shorted. So from A to B, if a market, if you're going to profit from a market and you buy at A, you're going to have to sell higher than you buy. And B minus A is your profit. So from A to B, if you connect the dots, guess what? B is going to be higher than A, and that is what? A trend. Now, that's a bit of a Captain Obvious type of statement, right? I know your eyes are rolling. But guess what? You'd be surprised at how many people fight the trend and how many people email me. And it probably won't be today because most everybody here is, I'm, I'm guessing, a friend of the show. Although we do have record attendance, so we might have a few new people. But it amazes me. Hey, Dave, should I buy this stock? And it looks like that. When we get to the stock portion, mark my words. Now, of course, you've been warned now, so maybe you won't. But go back and look at prior shows and see as a trend follower, as a card-carrying trend-following moron, as someone who preaches trend-following day in and day out, go in and watch the archives on YouTube of the Week of Charts. And you can get them off my website, by the way. And notice how many times people ask about stocks that they want to buy that are going straight down. Now, trading with the trend is is not what you see is all there is. I think that's thinking fast and slow is where I borrowed that uh, that quote from or acronym. Now, what's kind of interesting is people follow along the service for a while and they're like, you know, Dave just trades a bunch of IPOs. And then they're like, well, you know, Dave just trades a bunch of mining stocks. Dave trades a bunch of biotechs, or Dave only trades and insert what's trending at the moment there. And that's what I do. I just trade where the action is, where the trend is. And a lot of times people think, well, Dave's always bearish. Well, that's because the market is going down. Well, Dave never does anything. Well, that's because the market is chopping sideways. Well, Dave's always bullish. Well, that's because the market is making new highs. So if you just, it's kind of like the elephant, you know, the blind man filling up, feeling up on, filling up? Feeling up on the elephant. You know, one guy's going to feel a tree, a trunk, whatever. Uh, trunk's going to feel like a rope or the tail's going to feel like a rope. Uh, the leg's going to feel like a, a um, what do you call it? Uh, a trunk of a tree. The ear flapping is going to feel like a fan. It, you know, each one's going to feel something different and maybe not see the whole picture, at least the longer term picture when it comes to markets. So I was asked to cover bow ties today. I gave a presentation yesterday for London Investment Week, and hopefully I'll get to visit those guys uh, in May on my world tour this year. I haven't set everything up. Uh, February so far is the first date. I'll be at Traders Expo for uh, both a paid event and a free event. So I'm very much um, looking forward to that. But uh, I was asked yesterday to cover uh, bow ties in a little bit more um, detail, specifically show me some more examples. So uh, I was able to pull some examples out that I used in yesterday's presentation and add a few more to it. So here's some things that I was doing late in 2015 and early 2016. So if we rewind and look back in time, in late 2015, what was happening? Well, the market was beginning to kind of, roll over. Now it was choppy and all over the place, but in general what was happening, it was beginning to head lower and then we had a bona fide sell-off underway. Okay. So if you take a look at the stocks we were trading, notice that in this particular case you had a stock that made all-time highs. Okay. 
It stalled short of its prior highs. That's not a sell signal yet, but notice that the moving averages came together and flipped over from uptrend proper order, meaning that 10 simple is greater than 10 exponential is, I'm sorry, 20 exponential is greater than 30 exponential, okay, to less than, less than, okay, it flipped over. And when they do so over a short period of time, and by the way, this is the 50. I like to put the 50 in here for reference. But when they do so over a short period of time, it makes a fulcrum, and it kind of looks like a bow tie. So if you had a little, a little guy here, let's see if I can do it. A little stick figure here, you know, it kind of looked like he's wearing a bow tie. So we had a short in this particular stock, and then there's quite a few more to cover, so it, it worked out fairly nicely. This was a bank, and you can see it made all-time highs here, and then it had a sharp thrust lower, and then began to pull back. Phil, Phil says, uh, Dave likes the 50-day, stop the presses. Uh, Phil's across the pond over there. He's he's uh, he's a good guy. He's one of my clients. He's, he's not just a good guy because he's a client, but, you know, that helps. If you want me to like you, become a client, and I'll just love you. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Phil used that 50 a lot. But here we had a first thrust pattern setting up, and that's when you have a sharp sell-off after a market is at or right at these all-time highs, ideal or at least multi-year highs. And this was a bank, okay? And we're going to take a look at these in the portfolio in one second. Uh, this was an insurance company, again, all-time high. And notice that it was in a longer-term uptrend. The 10 was, 10-day simple was trending higher. The 20-day exponential was trending higher, and then the 30-day exponential was all trending higher, too, or was trending higher, too. And the 10 was greater than the 20, and the 20 was greater than the 30, okay? And then notice they come together in a fairly tight fulcrum here. And litmus test there, or the if you wanted to quantify it, I say three to four days, but sometimes five or six days, you just kind of have to eyeball it and also keep an eye on the on the actual price as usual, okay? Make sure it's not a first thrust uh, and don't sit around and wait for that bow tie. And also notice if you have a big thrust or a decent thrust lower based on the volatility of the stock. This is a sleepy little insurance company, so the volatility is uh, kind of low. And, you know, and the same thing, you know, Dave just shorts big cap stocks. Well, yeah, that's what's happening now but or happening then. And also notice maybe if it's breaking down below a range or something and you also have that first thrust, then you're looking to sell that first little pullback. So that was an insurance company. This is a material construction company. Uh, it did bow tie. It kind of was a little sloppy, the bow tie back here, as you can see, but we didn't get the actual sell signal tool about right here. So that's just kind of like a generic pullback after a bow tie type of situation. And that was a sell there. Again, material construction stock. This was a leisure stock that bow tied down. This is Carnival Cruises. And you can see it made an all-time high here. It looks like it was headed higher based on the moving averages, but they began to roll over and cross over to form the bow tie. And then the sell was a one-bar pullback is all we're looking for. And sometimes we give it a little bit of wiggle room below that just in case, just so we don't get stopped out of noise alone. And there was a trigger when the trend began to resume. Now, when we get to the more current portfolio, I'll show you some live examples, and I'll walk you through the setups. So if you went back to late last year and the begin late, I'm sorry, yeah, late 2015 and early 2016, you would notice that the portfolio was 100% short, or 100%, I shouldn't say 100% short, 100% of the setups of the portfolio were on the short side. Why? Well, the market was rolling over. And as importantly, we were getting a lot of sell-side setups, short setups, okay? Now, if you look at the portfolio, we had a healthcare stock, a bank, an insurance stock, a material construction, leisure, and a REIT, okay? Why? Well, that's where the emerging trends were. Or that's where the action was. And that's why we went after those particular stocks. Now, if you want to know what's happening now, well, obviously the market's headed higher. And then also, if you go all the way back to February, 
what happened then? Well, we had a bow tie higher. We had a big, nice thrust higher in the overall market back in February. And we still have a position that we put on way back then. Why? Because we trend followers and because it has mostly, and mostly being a key word in that sentence, gone up since then. So let's look at the church of what's happening now as it relates to the current portfolio. Well, we just showed a portfolio that was 100% short positions. And somebody around that time is like, boy, Dave's a big bear. He's always bearish. All he does is short. And now we have 100% long positions. So they probably think Dave's a big bull. Now, where are those positions? Well, we have a mining and an energy or mining slash energy stock, CNX. Okay. We have a mining stock, which is a Coke producer. Okay, and that's kind of a steel play, I guess, because I think it takes a lot of coke to um, to make steel. And I think I unplugged here. Oh, here we go. Okay, and then we had uh, a biotech, which was also an IPO. We had a mining stock, and this stock here is an IPO, but it's a bank. Okay. And what did I say in the in the IPO course? You know, what's the story of Fatter Glory? What's exciting about a bank? Well, nothing, okay? And, and as far as Fatter Glory, it's sometimes a food stock might be something new that's hot, or either a clothing company might be something new that's hot. Uh, obviously, a biotech could be a very hot IPO or some sort of new technology. But a bank, ah, oh, you know, what's so great about a bank? Well, it had a decent setup, okay, which we'll look at in just one second. It was trending nicely, okay? So it's like, well, it might not have anything exciting going on, but guess what? Banks are going through the roof now, and what a better way to play a bank as opposed to buying some big, sleepy, old, fat U.S. bank, okay? Play some, a little IPO bank, okay? That might benefit from this thing. Now, I'm not trying to put all the pieces together and come up with some big picture scenario, okay? What I'm trying to do is see what's trending and the banks are starting to act like dot coms so guess what that's the hypodermic needle intravenous drug use thing right so if the banks are going higher and they're acting like dot coms what do i want to be long banks and what better way to get along a bank than find a little ipo bank that might have some excitement because it's new and exciting new and improved versus like an old, big, fat U.S. bank again. And then also we have a material and construction stock. These stocks, material construction, seem to be doing fairly well. Why? Well, if you could build a wall, it's going to take a lot of materials and construction. In this particular case, it's a home builder. So let's back up to February. And again, I was asked to cover bow ties. In this particular case, it's not shown, but this stock was in a long, long, long-term downtrend. Now, it wasn't quite a Phoenix stock like uh, Gary was asking me uh, because it just kind of bottomed out a little bit before taking off. Ideally, if you want something to be a Phoenix stock, you want to seem to go sideways forever. And during this sideways forever movement, what happens is, unfortunately, people die. Unfortunately, people get divorced. And those stocks get settled through a state settlement or through whatever you call a divorce uh, split up or whatever. Uh, people get tired of holding the stocks. People need money. People's children uh, need to go to school, need some money. Uh, people need money to retire. I don't know if I mentioned that or not. But anyway, a lot of things happen that have nothing to do with the underlying stock. But if you do want to talk about the underlying stock and you do want some reasons, and oh, tax loss selling or tax whatever could be another reason. But if you want to talk about the underlying stock, sometimes a company will get their act together. Okay, Sometimes it could be a longer term cyclical cycle that could happen like uh, we don't need metals and mining because the economy is not so great. And all of a sudden a president comes along and says they're going to make the economy great again. You know, Who knows? We'll see. We'll just have to wait and see. Um, by the way, I, I guess I, I overcompensate. I try to pretend that uh, I try to stay as neutral as possible. And actually, the client said, "I thought you were liberal." And I was like, "Oh, <laughs> I guess I oversold it." Um, anyway, so this stock, longer-term downtrend, 
and it hits major, major lows here, all-time lows, I believe. And then look what happens. The 10 turns up, 20 turns up, 30 turns up, and makes a nice little bow tie setup. It's also a first thrust setup. Now, it doesn't look like it, but if you look from here to here, that's like a 75% run. And it also cleared the prior highs in here, so that's certainly a good thing. And then obviously it pulls back. So let's look at how it played out. So again, there's your bow tie, which we had an entry right around here. And then we put a protective stop in place, just in case. And then if you add all this up, this gave us an additional profit target up here. By the way, in case you're wondering, the entry minus the stop, whatever that distance is, you add that to the entry, and then that gives you the additional profit target. Now, what's your profit target on the remainder? Well, I don't know, as, as much as possible, okay? You got to be a greedy bastard then, okay? You just hold on for a long, long time. So once you get those initial profit targets out, and even slightly before, you trail that stop higher and you allow it to gradually loosen, out, loosen up so you're able to hopefully ride out many, many long-term corrections and then you turn it to a longer-term trend follower. So SXCP, a little bit more recently, we got into that one back in August. Nice little double top knockout move, little knockout bar there. One of my favorite patterns. And we would look to buy it as we get to rally, but what happened? It began to implode a little bit. Had a little bit of a dividend here. That caused some problems. And then it came fairly close to stopping us out, but then what happened? It began to turn around and rally nicely, hit the initial profit target. So this is probably, if I went back in the archives, I'm sure at one point I talked about the dead money of this position here. But what do you do? Well, we're not trying to look smart. We're trying to make money. And we don't care if we get stopped out. Okay? Yeah, I'm going to drop an F-bomb. Yeah, I'm still human. I mean, come on. <laughs> but I'm going to get over it. It's like I still curse, cuss and fuss a lot. But I do find that my recovery is much faster now. It's like I might drop an F-bomb, but I'll scream next and move on and begin immediately to try to find the next big opportunity. So in this particular case, as always, once we hit the initial profit target, we go ahead and trail that stop higher to hopefully stay with the position for a long, long time. And that's these are all straight from the open portfolio. Now, this was an IPO, had a bit of a deep retracement. If you're new, if you know the methodology, but you don't uh, have the IPO course, these deep retracements might be a little bit uh, strange to you. As I said, in the course, we do bend the methodology a little bit. By the way, if you want the course uh, for watching this, I'll give you 200 off because uh, I'm a nice guy, right? <laughs> uh, but we do bend the methodology a little bit. And, you know, all these courses, I, I do, I, I hate to soft sell, but they pay for themselves. I I could say that with a conviction. In fact, in one case, I actually lost client, lost a client because uh, from this trading service because they were doing so well at IPOs. And I tried to tell her, hey, you know, <laughs> I can't guarantee you this IPO market is going to go on forever. It's kind of like years ago, somebody was shorting stocks and they were making so much money shorting stocks. They're like, Dave, I don't need you anymore. I'm just going to short stocks. It's like, well. What happens? Well, 2009 ends, that bull, that bear market ends, and then you get a bull market. So be careful about what you see is all you get. But right now, I'm enjoying the heck out of it, and I'm I'm almost thinking about putting an IPO service out. I'm sure that's going to be the nail in the coffin there. Uh, but anyway, it had a stop down here. So what happened? Well, it went sideways a little bit. That was our dead money report a few weeks back. It finally hit the initial profit target, and so far we're trailing that stop higher. And hopefully next year, if you guys uh, and girls are willing to come to the show, maybe we'll be talking about some of these same stocks again. Here's that mining stock. Nice little pullback there. Nice little trigger. They don't always work this well. Believe me, I wish it did. And within a couple of days, it's up near the initial profit target. Go back and watch two weeks ago where I did a show, or a week ago where I did a show about uh, discretionary call. You would actually take profits here. I don't want to get into the details of that. You can go watch the show. And then trail your stop higher. And finally, the this is the bank IPO. Came public back here. Not a whole lot of excitement back here. But then it finally began to break out. 
I'm not a breakout player or a big fan of breakout player, but I do have some breakout patterns, one specifically that I will use in IPOs uh, because IPOs have a little bit of a better breakout characteristic than uh, stocks in general. And the reason is not, a, not everybody, you don't have uh, tons of people who own it. You don't have tons of analysts following it. You don't have all these issues and bad memories, so to speak, that you have in a more established issue. So anyway, we get a trigger in the pullback. What happens? Well, we place a stop just in case we're wrong. And that gives us initial profit target up here. And then a trailing stop. Well, not much of a trailing stop because it hasn't moved much yet. Now, once or if I should say it hits the uh, Andre hold off on stock picks, please. You know the rules. <laughs> uh, once it hits the initial profit target, then we'll, if the stop isn't near there, we'll bump that up to break even. So the stop will look like that once it gets the initial profit target. And then we're going to let it just kind of flatten out and gradually loosen up. And then this one just triggered a couple days ago. We had a nice little uh, TKO type of move, trend knockout move. Okay. And we don't have a trailing stop on this one yet because it really hasn't made any progress as of late. So trailing stop is still a protective stop. So hopefully, and I hate to use the word hold, but hopefully we'll see some new highs here. We'll see that profit target. It will start trailing the stop higher. I wanted to show you two of the ones that haven't hit the profit target yet. So you can see that I'm not just showing you the winners. I'm showing you, hopefully, the winners ahead of time. And then, again, maybe next year, if you're kind enough to come to the show, we'll talk about these same stocks. And hopefully, I hate to use the word hope, but hopefully, I mean, you got to add some hope. I mean, you can't you can't base your methodology on hope. And as Tom McClellan uh, once said, he said, his drill sergeant uh, said, uh, in war, hope as in birth control is not a valid strategy. So plan your trade and trade your plan, and you can hope for the best. There's nothing wrong with being positive. I mean, shit, I was going to be a pessimist, but I figured it wouldn't work out. Now, when it comes to trend following, you can't fall in love with a sector. Early in my trading career, very, very early, when I first started trading, I fell in love with selected technology, um, some computer stocks because I was a big fan of uh, computers back then. I had a degree in computer science, fresh out of college. I was also a bit of a gold bug. I've always been a bit of a gold bug. When I was a kid, I was a gold bug. And I used to get the newspaper out and find these little cheap gold stocks and write, down, write them down in a notebook <clears throat> and follow along. Uh, I used to, I wanted my dad to buy gold I, to the point where I bugged him so much he started uh, he, he inquired about it and he got on a bunch of brokers cold call list and they would bug the stuffing out of him to buy gold. My, you know, he didn't appreciate that part, but I think he appreciated my interest in finance at uh, such a young age. But right now people email me, hey Dave, is it time to buy gold? It's like, you know, what did I just say? What did I you know, you don't hear me? <laughs> it's like what are the gold stocks doing? They're doing this. We're going to look at them in just one minute. Why would you want to buy a market that's going the wrong way? Okay. For ego purposes, you want to be the one who, who bought the low? Well, you know what? You're not going to get a prize for that. I mean, you might have some bragging rights, but why would you do that? Okay. If it's headed lower, it's headed lower. What is, is. Now, we don't know if it's going to turn around tomorrow, but what we're going to do is we'll let it bottom out. Maybe make a bow tie or something, and then we'll, we're all in, just like we were on the C and X that we just talked about. So you can't fall in love with a sector. And people, I know I tell a story every week, but it's like I ask my wife sometimes. I don't ask her anymore, but when I used to ask her, hey, what do you think about my column? And I was really excited about writing, uh, about you know her seeing what I wrote. I'm still excited about writing, but I'm not so much about, I don't really care what she thinks because I know what she's going to say. He's like, well, you say a lot of the same shit every day. It's like, well, yeah, that's right. And I'm going to keep saying the same shit until you people get it. And here it is. Here I am. I don't know how long I've been writing publicly since 19, uh, what's that, about 17 years I've been writing publicly. And I still get emails to this day, you know, like gold. Hey, Dave, it's time to buy gold from people who should know better. So I guess i got to keep saying the same stuff until you people get it. And by you people, obviously, 
most of the people here get it. I appreciate that. When you are a trend follower, you have to take what the market is giving. I'd much rather trade a little high biotech, but I'm buying banks now. Why? Because they're going up. You have to be willing to take what the market's giving. I'm not a big fan of shorting, but when the market starts going down, I short stocks. We used to, I used to do a lot of sailboat racing, and if we were fortunate enough to have the sailmaker on board when the wind was very light, then more often than not, we win the race. And it wasn't just because the sailmaker was on board, but it was, it was his philosophy. If you love light air, it'll love you. Usually, you're on a boat especially uh, in the summertime, and it's light air, and you just sit up there and you bake. And you're not supposed to move around a lot on the boat because it'll it, what little momentum you have, if any, it'll negate that or you won't get started. And it's just miserable because you can't really get out the sun. You just kind of sit where you are. But if you love light air, it'll love you. And with the sail baker would do is is he would make everybody sit still and then he would slowly move around and make little tiny tweaks to things and he would just like he'd get to the zone it's almost like he was uh it's like he left the boat and like mentally and was somewhere else and lo and behold he would get the boat moving again and if you're moving a quarter mile an hour or a half a mile an hour or an eighth of a mile an hour and everybody else is just sitting there, you're going to win the race. But it might not be what you want to do. I'd, I'd much rather uh, be hanging out with my, I guess she was my girlfriend at that time, uh, my fiance, whatever she was, my wife. I'd re much rather be hanging out with her than sitting on that boat baking. Um, I'd much rather get back to the dock, start drinking beer and hanging out with her, you know. But you have to love light air to love you. So where am I going with this? Well, if you love market trends as leo melaman said be a lover not a fighter if you love market trends and it's like you know what this market's going down i should be shorting i don't like to short but that's okay i gotta love the trend i'm in okay um not a big fan of these big cap stocks but hey they're rolling over so guess what i'm gonna do i'm gonna short big cap stocks these banks these reits these uh big financial insurance companies leisure company, et cetera, all those stocks we just looked at. So take what the market gives you. Now, again, the biotechs and the IPOs and these other speculative issues are much more fun to trade. But if the market is offering you banks and insurance, then take it. Insurance companies are doing really well right now. So we're going to look for some setups there. The other thing you can't do is you can't fall in love with the sector. Otherwise, you'll end up fighting the last war. We caught some moves in gold. Gold's been tricky to trade the last couple of years. It hasn't been easy. I'm not bragging because it's been tough. But if you catch a good trend in gold or like this little mining company, you can't fall in love with it. And psychologically, there's some issues there. And I don't want to get too far into it, and I don't want to let the freshman psychology rear its ugly head. And there's been a lot of experiments that, that have proven this. But the longer something is in your possession, psychologically, the more attached you will become to it. Okay? Just remember that or write that down. So let's say you're long this little mining stock from back in February, and you're feeling pretty good about mining stocks, especially the one you're long. Well, when the day comes for you to, to sell that stock, you're going to have to sell that stock. So if you're long, like I said earlier, the golds or whatever, and then they begin to roll over, they're not on sale, they're rolling over. So it's hard to give up your ego, and sometimes it's hard not to fight the last war. I was guilty of fighting the last war back in 2000 because I was having such a good time trading biotechs and internet and the dot-coms of the internet as they're going straight up doing a dot-com bubble that market was beginning to turn and I was uh, failed to realize that it's probably coming to an end okay lesson learned I was in Italy uh, when was that 2009 I think or two yeah I forget exactly what it was but 
I was sitting across the table, uh, John Bolger's on the side of the table, and, and, and he and I were talking. It's like uh, they were giving out awards for people who had, who these energy funds had just made all this money. And, you know, the guy was going up there and taking his award and all excited because he made 100% that year. And, you know, kudos to him. You know, God bless him for doing that. But I looked over at John and said, you know, these guys, you're not going to see one of these guys next year. And we didn't because they were in the right sector at the right time. But unfortunately for them, because they're an energy trader or energy long only mutual fund, they're going to have to buy energy stocks even though the energies have tanked and continue to tank. Okay. So they don't have the luxury of moving away from energy. So they got a little trophy on their shelf and they probably lost 50% the next year. So you can't fall in love with a sector. The good news is a private trader, you're not forced to just trade energy stocks. Okay. So it's like, I don't want to beat those guys up because they're doing what they have to do. Now, when it comes to trend following, they're very tough to predict. As I often preach, you can only predict the short term. That's why I'm slotted as a swing trader. But as you can see from that portfolio, we've got a lot of stocks that have been on for a very long time. So you can only predict the short term at best. And even that is, is problematic, okay, as far as, not problematic, but is uh, statistical. There's a probability there. And it's, a, it's not necessarily a great probability, you know, maybe somewhere between 50 to 75 percent of chance that you're going to get that that short-term trend right but if you do get it you could follow that trend forever now if you go back and look at that C, like at that CNX chart if you just look at the longer term chart it's like hey yeah it went up 135 percent or 120 percent I forget where it is or where it was and it you could draw a big blue arrow in the chart but there were a lot of zigs and zags in between and Covell once equated trend following to riding the bouncing Bronco. In fact, if you have his trend following book on the front of it, there's a bouncing Bronco. If you have an older version, uh, it does not, older edition, I should say, it doesn't have that. So it's like in later versions, after he made that statement, they decided to put that Bronco in the front of the book. Okay. All right, uh, a couple of announcements and we'll hop in. You've probably heard me talk a little bit about, about the beginner's course. A lot of those slides find their way into this uh, weekly presentation. And the reason I say and come back to the beginning is because it, it's taken me a long time to go through all these indicators and go through all these different things. And then if you boil it all down, I'm almost back to where I started. And uh, Bollinger used to say the true enlightenment comes when you, um, when you reach the beginning. It's like, and it's true. Uh, and there's a T.S. Eliot quote, uh, I forget the exact quote, but it's, it's in some of my, uh, if you look at on my website, in the end, we begin, if you do a search on that, I have that T.S. Eliot uh, quote. Basically, it says that you, you shouldn't seek from exploration, but then at the end of all your exploration, you'll find that you're, you're kind of back to where you started. And that's kind of where I am with the beginner's course. And I don't want to sound too esoteric, but if you're struggling in your trading and you are fighting those trends and you are fighting the last war and you're not honoring your stop, then maybe it's time to go back to the beginning, okay? Anyway, uh, hopefully I'll start recording that soon. Like I said, about a year and a half in the works. Um, I got the studio ready to go. I just got to got to get her done. Now, every example... I should say nearly every example. Every now and then there's something that, uh, that's worthy of an example that's not in the service. But I would say 99% of all the stocks that you see here are direct recommendations from me. Okay? And I don't want that to be in hindsight. That's why I have the Foresight in Hindsight service. And you can get that off my website. If you go to Getting Started, it's about three or four down or maybe number six. And sign up for that. Now, eventually, you can't stay on that forever, unfortunately, because there's only room for so many. So, uh, But if you uh, if you did get kicked off, you want to get back in, just shoot me an email and say, hey, Dave, I'm, I don't have enough money to trade. Uh, I like what you're doing, though. I want to keep learning. And, and of course, I'll let you back on. But if, you're, if you have enough money to trade and you've been on for over a year, uh, good traders make fast decisions, quick decisions. So you, you probably don't want to be trading. Um, Anyway, any questions, shoot me a, an email at daviddavelandrew.com, and then obviously check out my website at davelandrew.com. All right, let's go to the live charts, and let's see what's happening.
All right, let's start off with the piece, and let's go ahead and open it up for um, uh, individual stocks. Go ahead and type those in now. Okay. All right, let's take a look at the piece. Looks pretty darn good, huh? That's the Russell. Let's take a look at the piece. Um, going back to November, we've had a pretty good run in here, okay? Now, when will it end? I don't know. The great thing about this rally, and I don't watch that much news, but I do catch some through osmosis. But the great thing about this rally is a lot of people are trying to poo-poo it, or poo-poo it, I should say, like it shouldn't exist. And so far, so good. We broke out not that long ago. We came right back in to kiss that range goodbye, which is actually an okay pattern. It's actually quite healthy. And then so far we take it off. And then based on today's rally, we're just off of all-time highs. So it doesn't take a rocket surge to see that the market is doing okay. And here's the deal. If a market is at or near new highs, air on the long side. I know. Duh. But you'd be surprised at how many people fight trends. I know. Let's take a look at the NASDAQ. Now, the P's actually look a little bit better than the NASDAQ. The NASDAQ came back into its prior range, but as I said quite often, or as I said, especially in this case, sometimes if they dip right back into a range and then take off again, it becomes a big do-over. Now, the longer they stay back in the range and the further they go back in the range, the more time people have to think about Oh, well, maybe junior, maybe I can't afford to send junior to Harvard anymore. We'll have to send them to a junior college. So they start thinking about the money. And remember, everything from a technical analysis standpoint, at least the way I see it, I'm not going to look at the moon, the sun, or some kind of arcane counting number or whatever, counting method. I'm going to say, hey, what are the participants likely doing or what are they likely thinking and might be inclined to do. So if that market pulls back into the range, they might be inclined, especially if they're a Johnny come lately and late to the game. Okay, um, I'm kind of a man on the streets empirical kind of research guy. Uh, an associate of my wife calls me up in a bit of a panic. She started trade. She started a, I should say, investing in 2015 or early 2016. She was already at a pretty serious loss, and then they also had some hefty fees on top of that. So she was kind of panicky and thinking about getting out. But had she gotten in and then had the market just made a little dip like it just did recently, let's say she started uh, back in November, makes a little dip, she gets a little nervous, but all of a sudden she checks everything and it's, it's doing fine. Or she might even check everything until it's way up here. And she's like, oh, I'm up 5%, so uh, life is good. So remember, there's people behind the bars, okay? NASDAQ right at all-time highs, not gonna argue with that. In an ideal world, I would like to see it get far away from this prior base before having any serious corrections. And the reason being, if it corrects too much, obviously, from where it is now, then we're back into the soup, so to speak, the sideways range. Rusty, looking pretty darn good. Rusty is kind of what I want to see the NASDAQ do. Just kind of get a long ways away from its prior base and then pull back. By the way, this is a good sign when you see a broad-based index like the Rusty 2000 in a nice uptrend like this and just off of its all-time highs. This tells me that the rally has broadened out. Early on, it was energies and metals and mining and material construction stocks, all of these stocks that I guess you're going to need to build the wall, right? But now it has broadened out nicely, and you can go through a few thousand stocks every night, like I do, to see that, which I would recommend you, I'd strongly urge you to do. Or if you don't have that much time on your hands, or you don't want to pay me to do it for you, at least look at the Russell 2000 and maybe at least look at some of these major industry groups too. Now let's take a look at some of the sector action before I forget gold. Look at that, okay? Hey Dave, is it time to buy gold? No! <laughs> no! 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 I know. So one of you guys, you can ask me about a gold stock just to piss me off, aren't you? I know you're going to do it. I see a couple of smart asses in here. That's okay. That's okay. <laughs> no, it's not time to buy gold. All right? That's gold the commodity. Stay away from gold. 
Stay away from silver, too, for that matter. Okay? Hey, Dave, is it time to buy silver? Ah, ha, ha, you beat me to it. <laughs> no! No! No. No. Now, if this goes down to $1, yeah, I, I might give you the okay on it. Because it's something that has end use. You could eventually, it eventually has a value. I don't want to digress too far. And that's not trend following. But even if it does go to a dollar, wait until it starts rallying up to $2 or $3 before you get in, okay? Let it bottom out. But silver, not looking so good, huh? I, it, I didn't even know it was getting whacked so bad today. Now, as far as the good news is, uh, energy, uh, chemicals, a lot of these big cap stock areas are doing really well, as you likely know. You can see chemicals just kind of pulling back in here, recently breaking out to new highs. A lot of the areas you're going to find have taken on the appearance of the overall market. That's nothing to, that's not big, there's no big epiphany there. Just it's what happens when the market trends for a while. Uh, energy's pulling back a little bit uh, today, now back to break even, but so far so good. As far as a recent breakout remains attack, just pulling back. Could see a lot more setups here soon. Uh, ditto for metals and mining, gold and silver notwithstanding. Okay, so take a look at the steels. Not bad. I would be looking at the steels right now for a possible setup. Here's the deal. I hate to say folks. You know, folks? I don't know. I hate those people. Like, here's the deal, folks. But for lack of a better word, here's the deal, folks. Here is a nice trend. Here is a trend that's accelerating, and here is a trend that pulled back. If the overall sector looks like this, there should be some stocks within the sector that could set up or are set up, okay? So this would be a good area to look for opportunities. Copper, nah, not too bad. Kind of a double top knockout looking sector. There's not as many stocks within copper, I think. Uh, aluminium, kind of a bit of a double top knockout. Make sure you wait for an entry based on this recent little slide, but not bad looking, okay? Gold stocks, I'm going to go into Nicholas Fine mode. No, if you don't know who Nicholas Fine is, Google him. Silver stocks, again, what would Nicholas do? No. Food stocks, no. Food stocks going down. Banks, yes, yes, look at that. Banks are acting like dot-coms, okay? We're long NTB, okay? And hopefully we'll be long NTB for a long, long time. Insurance stocks, yeah, not bad. Up here, new highs, okay? Draw your arrows. You ever get confused, that's your best friend, okay? Back of my business card, I have an uptrend, a downtrend, and a sideways trend. So if you ever lose your way, send me a self-address address stamped envelope. I'll give you my address. Uh, just email me, I'll give you my address, and then I'll send you uh, a card. Now, drugs are a little iffy in here. They took off, came back in, so I wouldn't rush out and buy drugs right now biotech kind of all over the place as much as i love biotech stocks little excited biotech stocks i wouldn't rush out and buy them i think we're long one ipo biotech or we were recently you know what's weird is i forget about what i bought shortly after i buy it it's like i never know it's like when i trade forex i never know what currencies i'm long or short you know people are like how do you feel about the pound i'm like i don't i don't know i don't remember um i know i'm long the pound or short the pound i forget but it's like I try to forget about it as, as soon as possible. Otherwise, I will become attached. And I might start searching for reasons why biotech stocks should be rallying because maybe Trump is going to be good for business and good for biotech and uh, whatever, you know, reduce the burdens on some of these companies. I don't know. But, again, you don't want to think about it too much. Uh, health service is not so hot here, just kind of chopping around, kind of a longer-term downtrend, chopping around. So I don't want to rush out and buy some health service stocks now. Defense looking pretty good, as you can see. Uh, just kind of pull back TKO-ish. It's not a big sector. There's not a whole lot of stocks there, but looking pretty good. Manufacturing, uh, just off of new highs, pulling back a little bit. Materials and construction, more along Havanarian, uh, looking pretty good. Recently broke back, broke out, pulling back a little bit. Retail, a little bit more tricky, okay. Was headed lower up until November, and now it's headed higher. So retail is not bad. It's not up at brand new highs like a lot of these other sectors, but it's certainly not bad. Transports. Some people are fans of the transports confirming the rally. I could I could care less other than if the transports are going higher, I consider that one piece of the puzzle. There's still some Dow theorists that are hanging out there. 
that believe that transports are good. And, you know, to some extent, um, that used to be like the rails versus the stocks overall, but to some extent it still makes sense because my, if you look out, uh, if you look at the amount of boxes in my house, we did all of our Christmas shopping or a significant part of Christmas shopping online. I order a lot of stuff simply because it's hard for me to get out of the house. Okay, I, I, I probably order too much stuff. Um, or I order stuff I don't need, but I order a lot of the stuff that I need, all of my computer equipment, um, anything, anything, virtually anything from my office is, is mail order other than, uh, you know, ink pens and, and paper and sundries like that. But if you look at the amount, if you look at this, uh, the, the amount of freight trucks in and out the neighborhood all day, so maybe the transportation still means something. If those transportation stocks are doing well, then what does that mean? Well, it means a lot of goods are being bought and sold, or however you want to look at it. So transports, I, I rank it as a positive. It doesn't have to, doesn't always have to confirm, but it's nice if it does. Take a look at the semis breaking out to all-time highs today, or not quite all-time highs. I think we're a little bit higher back in 2000, if memory serves. Yeah, a little bit higher, but close enough for government work. Uh, these stocks back here probably no longer exist, so uh, we're at 60 to your eyes. Okay. Um, some of these interest rate sensitive areas, REITs, utilities, kind of chopping around in here, so you don't want to rush out and trade those. Speaking of interest rates, take a look at rates, uh, or take a look at bonds, I should say. Now, bonds are beginning to bottom out, and if you if you use your mind's eye and look at this, it's kind of making this curved left side of a cup. Now, I wouldn't rush out and buy bonds just yet, but... The good news here is the descent has somewhat slowed. Notice that it was, they were just kind of falling out of bed, and now they're kind of going drifting lower. And I've seen this before, and um, somebody had sent me many years ago, this called, he called it the tongue pattern, where you just, it just kind of goes like, blah. you know, the market just kind of sticks out its tongue. I know it sounds a little weird. I would never trade this pattern. But when you get these big wedges down where a market just drifts down day after day after day, it, it's a bit of a bottoming type of process. But process is a key word in that sentence. And the same thing on the upside. If you have a market that's rallying, looks like this, and then you get like a drift, an upward drift, that's actually a bear, what I call a bearish wedge or what I guess everybody calls a bearish wedge. So be careful there. Okay, let's, uh, let's open up our stocks. <laughs> Sorry, folks. Parks closed. The booths out front should have told you. <laughs> the late John Candy. Yeah, the booths out front should have told you. That's funny. Family vacation, the original one. Okay. Oh, Andre, I got you. Andre had. Uh, Andre says I have to leave my meetings. All right, and watch recording. All right. All right. So now I know why you're punching all the stocks. I, I, that's fine. All right. You're. A, I'll give you a pass. Hey, we can talk about Andre. He's not. All right, lots of stocks coming in. All right, keep them coming. I'm going to try to get to. I'll try to get to all of them. All right, let's start with uh, Arsene GS. Arsene uh, GS. Uh, yeah, it looks pretty good. It's financial stock, obviously new highs. Not set up though, but yeah, a trend. That looks like a trend. Okay. Now, the HV is a little low. I'm not a huge fan of trading low HV stocks, but what did I say earlier? Love light air. It'll love you. Right now, some of these financials might be a little low in, uh, in HV. So, yeah, wait for a pullback. MDR, that's going to be McDermott. That's going to be a material and construction stock, obviously. Yeah, it looks pretty good. A little bit more knockout move, but nice persistent trend. Good job. Good job. I know somebody's going to ask me about a gold stock soon, but good job so far, you guys. Very smart. My work is done. Let me drop the mic. Klaus wants to know about uh, SVLK. That sounds like a shipper, doesn't it? Um, uh, it's it's kind of that Phoenix thing we talked about earlier, but it's a little bit extreme in that it is breaking out. What I would do is see if it could keep breaking out and then look to play pullbacks along the way. But, yeah. That's probably, I'm not a huge fan of shippers because they can be really choppy stocks, but recently we were going after, I think it was NNA uh, in the shipping, um, and we might go after it soon again. But see if it can keep breaking out and then look to play uh, pullbacks along the way, okay? Yeah, be careful with the bottom fishing there, but 
as long as they're going higher. Hey, Dave, are you using Fibonacci numbers uh, also? No, not really. Um, I'm not a big fan of Fibonacci. The problem with Fibonacci is a lot of people overuse it. It's not the use of it. It's the overuse of it. And they start drawing all these lines on the chart. And if you draw enough of them, it's always going to be at some sort of Fib number. And it's always like, well, if it gets through this level, then then it'll, then it'll reverse here, then it'll reverse here. There's always a new reversal part. So as a general statement, I'm not a big fig, Fib fan, but I do know some people that use it, and I am friendly with them. Uh, so I'm not, like, totally against it. I have noticed that it does occur on occasion. If you look at those um, deep retracements and IPOs we talked about, if you wanted to plot a FIB number on those, it would probably reverse at that FIB number. So I'm kind of like the jury's still out on Fibonacci as far as I'm concerned. There is something there that seems to uh, occasionally occur. But as a general statement, I do not use it. I do have one little pattern, and I usually just eyeball it when it occurs. I have one pattern that does have use the word Fibonacci in it, so I don't want to be a hypocrite. But usually I just eyeball. And in fact, if we go back to, well, I'm not going to do it now. It's just, I don't want to get lost. But sometimes if a stock makes an all-time high and then has a sharp sell-off and then stalls short of that all-time high, that could be a good shorting opportunity, okay? It's like a failed double top, and that's a pattern I will trade. I call that a gatekeeper, Okay. And I just eyeball this. I don't actually measure this. At least I don't measure it anymore. But if you look at these IPOs, they do have what I call the first deep retracement, the FDR. Okay. And again, I just eyeball this too. But I think if you did use Fibonacci, it would be fine. Uh, if you look at my first book, I kind of hinted to the fact that you could use Fibonacci on these IPOs. It's kind of it's in there. Um, and you could see it could work pretty nice. And the reason, like, what did I say earlier? The problem with Fibonacci people is, you know, they're always drawing all these lines. The, the charts end up looking like this, you know. And then, you know, the market, the market reverses, like, right here or reverses right here. It does something. And they're like, ah, you see, it reversed right to Fibonacci. It's like, yeah, but you had, like, 100 lines on your chart, Okay. But with IPOs, Fibonacci, you need three points, right? One, the low, two, the high, three, the retracement. It's cut and dry. It's there for you, one, two, three. So if you are going to use Fibonacci, yeah, and something like IPOs, knock yourself out. Again, I just I just eyeball it. I call it an FDR, first deep retracement. But, yes, if you did measure this, it would probably come out something Fibonacci-ish. In fact, let's uh, take a look at that in the chart. Uh, what was that? Uh, what was the name of that stock? Uh, Novin? See, I told you I forget about things soon after I get in. Uh, let's take a look at that and see. And then Pi comes to mind, too. Pi was one that did a first deep retracement. Yeah, see, look at that. That's kind of cool. Now, I won't always do this. And, again, I just eyeball it. But notice that, yes, it did reverse there. So if you were to incorporate a little Fibonacci into your trading, maybe uh, major reversals off of major highs and look for a bounce back to stall short of that high, and then the first deep retracement in IPOs. But other than that, not a huge fan of Fibonacci. It's like, well, can, you can't get a little bit pregnant. Well, in this case, I think it's okay to have a little bit. If you take a look at Pi, bigger picture-wise, you could see it did, uh, it did that retrace back to that Fibonacci level before taking off again. Okay. But as a general statement, no, not a big fan because, again, people end up drawing 50 different lines on a chart, and it's always going to be a Fibonacci retracement. Let's just go back to the beginning on this one. I wonder if it was back here. Oops. Let's do something here. See, I don't even remember how to draw them. There you go. Yeah, see, look, right here. So it does occur in IPOs. Now, for me to wrap my head around something, I have to understand it. It has to be some sort of logical, conceptually correct Reason in an IPO, a deep retracement makes sense because you have a lot of the insiders that are trying to get out. They're trying to become whole because they need money, and that's their main source of income. They've dumped everything into this company, and they need that money to get out, to get out of debt or whatever. Um, 
the speculators, the flippers, people like that, they're looking to get out quickly so that deep retracement shakes them out. And then the trend is still there. You have a nice big trend. So you're not making a contra trend play. You're just playing a deep retracement of that original trend. So that's how I wrap my head around that pattern. And I don't call it Fibonacci. Uh, Fibonacci does occur in life and in nature, or whatever you want to call it, in nature in the markets. Again, not a big fan. So I, I would just, I guess what I'm trying to say is don't use Fibonacci as some sort of mystical, magical thing. Uh, use it very sparingly and make sure there's some sort of conceptually correct concept or something conceptually correct behind what you're doing. Like a deep retracement on IPO does make sense to me, okay? Okay, Sam says, no matter where you travel in the universe, you will never be far from a GAN line or a Fibonacci retracement expansion level, John Bollinger. <laughs> I'll ask him about that quote. Uh, his larger point was one that the chartists need to learn, which is that if you draw enough lines on a chart, yeah, 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 if you draw enough lines on a chart, I'm a member of um, Tom McClellan's forum, which used to be Bollinger's forum, uh, and Tom McClellan invited everybody that was in Bollinger's forum over, and I just kind of lurked there. But a few days ago, they actually said, if you draw enough lines on a chart, so I, uh, it's interesting. If you draw enough, his larger point was that, a lot of chartists need to learn is if you draw enough lines on a chart, one of them eventually is going to look important, but that does not mean that the market is obligated to respect it. Tom McClellan. Oh, yes. Okay, perfect. Uh, yeah, Tom McClellan. And it's ironic you mentioned Tom McClellan because that was just at his forum a few days ago. Uh, he was talking about that. All right, Jim wants to know about CMC. And who's next? One of the Donalds will be next. Um, it looks okay. I think I would... You know, my concern here is it did kind of lose some momentum here. It took off a little bit, and now it came back in. Um, notice that it took off with a vengeance and then kind of lost steam. Try to take off again, then it pulls back. If the pullback looked more like this, okay, if you didn't have this, this losing momentum in here, I'd be more excited about it. But it does look okay. I mean, you could certainly do a lot worse. Uh, trading a gold stock or something, right? AJ wants to know about LPG. Hey, AJ, welcome aboard. LPG. Yeah, this looks good. It's a shipper. And a little bit on the thin side, though. Not too thin, but sort of a little thin. Uh, my only problem here, and this is the, the reason I would pass on this, is because it does have a lot of overhead supply. Remember, there are people behind the bars. People might be looking to get out at break-even. But shorter term, I hear you, but too much, um, too much. TMST is like TKO. Let's take a look. Uh, I wouldn't call it exactly a TKO, but it's certainly a pullback. It could use a little bit more pullback, but not bad. BRS. Okay, Edward, you're next. And I'm going to get to some of you guys have been waiting longer, too. Um, BRS looks good, needs more of a pullback, but so far so good. Let's back the chart out a little bit, take a look. Yeah, not too bad. You know, you got a big bottom longer term. You got a huge picture cup and handle. This is a stock. It has a bit of that Phoenix characteristic we talked about earlier. Um, you know, it was up around 80 bucks a share in 2014. Now it's way down here around 20. It might return to its old glory. It might be a Phoenix stock. It doesn't have a whole lot of bad memories along the way meaning overhead supply. So, yeah, on a pullback, put this on your radar. Uh, absolutely. Put that on your radar and, and keep an eye out. John wants to know about QNTA. He's waiting patiently. QTNA, I think. And I'll give you a couple more while I'm here, John, just, be, just for being so nice and waiting. Um, you know, here's, a, here's another one of those deep retracements and IPOs. Again, you know, if you draw enough lines, something's going to be there. But you could see that it, it had this big deep retracement and didn't go down to all lows. Popped up, came back in, though. Uh, I would pass for now. I, it would have to reset. It would have to make new highs before getting excited about it. And let's wipe out another one for you while we're here, John. HFC. HFC. Uh, yeah, this looks interesting. Let's back the chart out a little bit. A little bit of problems here. Not enough to worry about. little problems here. But, hey, if it goes up 20 bucks, good problem to have. So I'll give that one an okay. Uh, it's, it could... Use a tiny bit more pullback, but it's certainly not bad. You could certainly do much worse. 
I'm going to stop just short of a high five on that one. IPI I've been watching. Uh, it's, it's a little crazy, a little volatile, but I have been watching this one. I know somebody in here bottom fished. I'm not going to say his name, Phil. Yeah. Um, I would never do that, but uh, so far so good as far as that is uh, concerned. Um, and, you know, one thing we talked about, actually Phil and I talked about this, if you knew a company would never go out of business, then by all means you could buy them down here at a dollar a share and put a stop at zero. In other words, treat it like an option that never expires. Unfortunately, you don't know that that's going to happen. And a lot of these trades where you bottom fish will end up, uh, you'll end up losing your money. So it's not, a, not, not necessarily a good idea to bottom fish like that. Uh, it looks okay. I prefer a little bit deeper retracement. And look at the HV. The HV is a little bit too much. So I would pass. Uh, it's on my watch list, but I would pass for now. Claus wants to know about Citibank. C. That's going to be a big, thick bank, obviously. Uh, 20 million shares. Let's see, 1, 2, 3. 197 million, is that right? I mean, just ridiculous amount of shares. HV is a little low. Uh, you know, but David, I thought you said you trade banks. Yeah, but... Maybe try to find something a little smaller to trade, but it's not bad. I certainly can't argue with it on a TKO type of move. You'll need some sort of sell-off or pullback on that, okay? Confluence is key to using Fibonacci analysis successfully. I don't know if I agree with that. If you're trying to, if you're plotting too many lines, I hear what you're saying, and I know some people that do that. Um, and, and I think what, what Donald's trying to say is you draw up, if, if you get a bunch of different retracements from a bunch of different levels and they all end up at one spot, that becomes a confluence. Um, I know some people that do that. I'm just not a big fan of the Fibonacci stuff. Again, to me, it seems like you draw enough lines on a chart, something's going to mean something. But, uh, you know, Carolyn Barode, and I'm, I'm friends with her, and, and she seems to do well with, with using that confluence thing. Uh, it's just it's not my cup of tea, but I haven't studied it enough to, uh, to, to have an opinion other than, than – I think if you draw a whole bunch of lines on a chart, it's always going to look like it's something. Okay. But I, I hear you on that. Uh, CBI. Did we cover that one? And Donna, we'll get to a couple of euros and next. It looks okay. You know, my only problem here is it just, it's, it's like two days of this huge breakout. Um, I like to see a little bit more follow through in a breakout other than one or two days. He has a little bit of overhead to deal with. Not much. Um, I'm not a huge fan of the refiners, but I will, again, if they're selling uh, hypodermic needles and drug use is going up, then maybe I'll, um, I'm all in. Uh, refiners tend to do the opposite of what oil does, and the reason for that is that oil uh, is a cost of goods sold. And I wouldn't say that I'm exactly bullish on oil, but oil looks like it's kind of bottoming out longer term. This is oil a commodity, and over the last few weeks it's headed higher. So, um Refiners are kind of tough to play. It's like you think they're an oil company, but they're really not. So that's the only problem. <laughs> QB. And that's for Donald. Uh, yeah, on a pullback, absolutely. That's a bank, okay? A uh, little bit on the thin side, but that's okay. See, I'd rather, I'd rather trade a QB than a Citibank, okay? So, yeah, on a pullback, that might be worthwhile. Absolutely. Good eye on that one. TGB. That's going to be a mining company. TGB. Yeah, that looks pretty good. Now, it is a, it's kind of a penny stock in here. And eh, it's got some overhead supply, but that's at 2 bucks. So, that's not bad. I'll give it a not bad. Okay. Um, you know, maybe just use a stop at zero on that. <laughs> it's not bad, but it's obviously speculative, uh, penny stock, dangerous. Please look at Rick. Rick is, uh, is that Rick's Cabaret? I'm not allowed to look there. Uh, no, this is uh, RCA Hospitality Restaurant. Didn't it used to be Rick's Cabaret? Kind of reminds me of Hooters. Uh, now they're restaurants. All the benefits of being a stripper without all that troubles in cash. Uh, a little bit on the thin side. Only 50,000 shares today and 50,000 shares on average. So it's too thin. Uh, as a private trader, sometimes you get away with some of these things, but uh, you'd never probably see me recommend a stock like this uh, directly. Uh, you, but, yeah, maybe on a pullback, just looking at the pattern. But 
one thing you have to be careful with with technical analysis, in this case it looks like it seems to be enough people trading it to work, but you do have to have a representative sample when it comes to technical analysis. As a general statement, I like thinner stocks, I like uh, smaller cap stocks, but you reach a point if they get too small, then you no longer have a representative sample unless let's just say one big trader comes in and, and does something and then it makes the market, just wipes the market out or moves the market or whatever. I actually met someone that traded with microcaps and his whole deal was to try to actually manipulate the market and he was trying to suck me into his game. I'm like, no thank you, but but that gives you a good example of what could happen. One person can do something. Gary, I'm not going to go, we're not going to do anything with this because it's kind of all over the place, okay? That's the electrocardiogram stock and hopefully I got the symbol right, but um, it's up, it's down, it's up, it's down. It's a Jackie Mason stock. If you look at a stock and you hear beep, 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 it's the stock you don't want to trade. I have I switched computers, so I can't find my electrocardiogram anymore in this computer. But you'll just have to use your mind's eye. But yeah, let's pass on that. But we'll get you up to speed. Don't worry. CC for Donald. Uh, looks kind of interesting. It needs a little bit more pullback. Absolutely. And you know what? Uh, Rick is Rick Cabaret, I think. Yeah. Okay. Do you do you do did you do FN? I did not. Uh, no. This is uh who's who asked that? Uh, Sam, no Sam, sorry. Uh let's cardigram. Okay. C V E O for Jim. So they serve food at Rick's now. Somebody tell me that Hooters is serving food now. Uh, my only problem with this one is it just barely got out above its prior peak, and now it's come back to its prior peak. I would look for something that has uh, cleared the range a little bit more decisively. AKS, it's going to be a metal stock, I think. Uh, yeah, a little more, a little more pullback, and it'd be okay. Nice little uptrend here. Uh, needs a little bit more pullback, so wait for the more pullback. All right, let me go into lightning round, PDCE, PDCE. Uh, yeah, independent oil and gas. Uh, yeah, not bad. Maybe a little bit more pullback. I think you could probably find something a little bit better in oil and gas. Uh, TCS. Um, that's not bad. Uh, that's not bad. Got problems here, that's okay. This gap here, that's done. Let's take a look more recent times. Uh, it's not bad. It's 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 interesting. Uh, a little bit deeper pullback maybe, but that's that's interesting. I like that. There's something about it that that's really catching my eye, and I'm in lightning round here. I can't, but that jumps out at me. And as I often say, if something jumps out at you, that's usually a good stock. A little, it just needs a little bit more pullback, you know, into the into the sixth level. But yeah, that's that's pretty interesting. Um, you know, I think what I like is that it is accelerating higher, so that's kind of interesting. Again, I know I said that. Hey, Dave, you keep looking for more pullback. Is shallow pullback acceptable in a roaring bull market? Otherwise, hard to get in. Yeah, Eric, that's a good question. Eric's question is: Is a shallow pullback acceptable in a roaring bull market? Because otherwise, if you wait for that deeper pullback, it's harder to get in. Um, it depends. Well, here's the thing. In a volatile stock like this, HV up around 60, you would almost want to see a little bit more pullback. But sometimes if you get in a rip-roaring bull market, you don't get this big pull pullback. Um, I don't think we're quite into a rip-roaring bull market yet. But to answer your question, yes, if we get to a rip-roaring bull market, stay tuned. Uh, then we might end up trading more of these type of stocks because we might not get these knockouts. But usually you will, and as long as we're getting enough of these, I'm not going to switch over to these, at least not just yet. But I hear you on that. RUSL for Thomas. USL. How are you next? Uh, yeah, that's a, the only problem is this is a uh, triple leverage thing, so I'd avoid it because of that. Um, but yeah, it's waking up in here, certainly. Uh, maybe look at the unleveraged version of it, and you know, a little bit more pullback would be nice, but I hear you. But look at the unleveraged version. It might be worth a shot. C, E, C, E, and then how are you next? Sorry, C, E, C, E. One jumped ahead of you. Uh, I don't like the fact this kind of lost momentum in here. It took off, lost momentum. 
So I pass on that one. PATK. PATK. Yeah, it's trending. Uh, it's a little bit on the thin side on a pullback. You know, the only problem is if you get a pretty good pullback on this one, it might be close to the base. So like Justice Powder Stewart, what's his name? We'll know when we see it. Is that a cup and handle on CDI? CDI. Yeah, but I'm going to try to get to those two. We're kind of running out of time. Uh, yeah, it's a cup and handle. Uh, but that's that oil and gas one we're talking about. Um, I don't know. I think I'd just go long energies in general as opposed to that. Dow. Um, yeah, the problem is it's another one of those needs more pullback situations and then we'll get back to this base. Put that on your momentum list. Keep an eye on it. I'm not a huge fan of the airlines, but sometimes you have to take what the market gives. And the reason is a lot of times, as you can see, they're really choppy. And it's a horrible business to be in. I know I'm confusing the issue with facts, but there's just so much other good stuff out there. I don't see any reason to go after uh, airlines. CIM for Edward. Okay. Uh, my problem here is that it came back into its breakout, so I would pass on that one. Uh, we're out of time. Boy, it went by fast. I have a blast doing these things, as you can tell. I love doing these shows, and I appreciate you guys and girls showing up. I'm humbled by you being here. It looks like everybody toughed it out, stuck to the end. That's that's great. This is the biggest uh, biggest numbers we've ever seen in this late. Anyway, let me go ahead and wrap things up. If we don't talk between now and then, everybody have a fantastic weekend. Anything unanswered, daviddavelandry.com. And uh, check the website. Maybe we'll put some sales up over the next uh, week or so at Christmas just, just around the corner. Uh, again, everybody have a great weekend. We'll talk again, uh, I guess, next Thursday, if not sooner. Thank you so much.